Sonnet 71, No Longer Mourn For Me When I Am Dead, by William Shakespeare. So there are 154 sonnets, and this is one of the sonnets addressed to the fair youth and focuses on death and ageing. Um, it's in the Shakespearean sonnet form, and as you know, the Shakespearean sonnet has three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. Like the Petrarchan sonnet, the change often begins on line 9 and the Petrarchan sonnet calls this the Volta. The Petrarchan sonnet form also has 14 lines but it's broken up as uh, in an octave and a sestet and so the sestet uh, begins on line 9 and that's where the change is often um, seen. The rhyming couplet in the Shakespearean sonnet which is this particular sonnet form, resolves the issue discussed in the three quatrains. And we're going to have a look at the rhyme scheme. And we're also going to count out the iambic pentameter. So iambic pentameter um, is a line of uh, poetry that contains 10 syllables. And the syllables are broken into pairs. So you've got five pairs. So five times two equals 10. And in each uh, metrical foot, you've got two syllables, one unstressed and one stressed syllable. No longer mourn for me when I am dead, then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled, from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so, that I and your sweet thoughts would be forgot, if thinking on me then should make you woe. Oh, if I say you look upon this verse, when I perhaps compounded am with clay, do not so much as my poor name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay, lest the wise world should look into your moan and mock you with me after I am gone. So if we look first at the rhyme scheme, dead bell fled dwell, A, B, A, B, not so forgot woe, C, D, C, D, verse clay rehearse decay, E F E F moan gone G G although that's really half uh, a half rhyme moan and gone moan and gone and then the iambic pentameter no longer mourn for me when I am dead if you clap that out no longer mourn for me when I am dead one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so that um this this is definitely a sonnet we've got the three quatrains, the rhyming couplet, we've got the word O signaling the volta, we've got iambic pentameter, and so it's behaving exactly as a sonnet would, introducing the problem in the quatrains and then resolving it in the couplet, and we're going to take a look at the quatrains um, soon. So I've tried to paraphrase the poem, do not mourn for me when I'm dead, you will hear the sad and unhappy church bell tell the world that I'm dead, leaving this awful world to live with disgusting worms that will eat my decaying flesh. No, if you read this line, do not remember the hand that wrote it, because I love you so much that I'd rather be forgotten in your lovely thoughts, if thinking about me will make you sad and mourn. Oh, if you look at this poem when I'm buried in earth, do not even say my name, but rather let your love for me die and decay like my body is decaying in the earth. In case the wise world that mocks me will mock you with me for loving me after I'm gone, possibly for his poems like this one, he is expecting to be mocked and he doesn't want his lover to be mocked with him for loving him and lamenting his death. So the paradox is that he's asking his lover not to remember him when he dies, but he then um, produces this poem, creates this poem that is likely to make it much harder for him to forget him. And who was this fair youth that, that this sonnet was written to? There are many fascinating papers on the identity of the fair youth. One of the more compelling suggestions is that he was one of Shakespeare's patrons, the third Earl of Southampton. But there are other contenders and it makes for quite interesting reading. If you have time, go and take a look and see what you can find. There are also critics who feel his love for this person might have been platonic and others who feel it is impossible to deny the romantic language in the sonnets. And I leave that to you to decide. So looking a little more closely at this, at this sonnet, 
in the first quatrain, No longer mourn for me when I am dead, then you shall hear the surly, sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled, from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. So that first sibilant, so that uh, sibilant line, the surly, sullen bell, is being personified. The bell is not surly and sullen. The mourners are. So there's an epithet that's being transferred, but it's also a sullen sound. So it's not entirely um, just the just a transfer of um, the sullen um, mourners. It is also giving warning. Another instance of personification, as the bells would ring out for funerals. So the bells are warning. And then from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Um, so he uses this idea of having fled from the world. So the poet claims the world is unkind and vile here and at the end as it mocks him. So, so that, I, that word fled is even more apt when you consider that he's fled from the world. He uses the same adjective vile to describe the worms that will eat him. The poet feels strongly that society is, is cruel and unkind, and we think he's probably talking about his critics. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so, that I and your sweet thoughts would be forgot, if thinking on me then should make you woe. So to feel woe is to feel misery from affliction or an intense mournfulness, and we've heard that word mourn. And so this is where the central paradox is contained because um, he's saying, do not remember the hand that wrote the sonnet, but here is a sonnet so you cannot forget. The tone of the stanza is tender and quite loving. He's calling his lover's thought sweet, but in fact, it is the lover whom he views as sweet. So, so this is another example of a possible transferred epithet. Oh, if I say you look upon this verse when I perhaps compounded am with clay, do not so much as my poor name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay. So here yeah, he's hoping that his love, um, that his love, lover's love will decay with his body. He wants his lover to forget him. Do not look at this poem and even say my name. Do not rehearse it. Do not say it. He uses this quite hard C alliteration to emphasize the finality of his burial compounding the words with harsh sounds in the clay, not just the body in the hard clay. And I think this is quite clever. And then the rhyming couplet, uh, where he resolves what he's introduced in the three quatrains. So he's introduced this idea of being forgotten. And um, then, then he, basically, then he uh, summarizes that by saying, lest the wise world should look into your moan and mock you with me after I am gone. So um, I've identified the W alliteration, but also notice the moan, mock and me, um, which emphasizes um, the, that moaning sound, the mocking. Um, we have this uh, uh, M alliteration too. The sonnet serves as a warning. Forget me, because if you do not, the wise world will mock you for remembering me. And mock you with me, because he's obviously expecting to be mocked, or at least one can assume that. The poem is not just to his lover, it serves as a criticism of his critics, which I think is clever. The phrase wide, wise world is alliteration, and probably a little tongue-in-cheek. Can it be wise to mock his works and their love so? The tone is somewhat bitter too. He expects to be scorned after his death. So that is Sonnet 71, No Longer Mourn for Me When I Am Dead by William Shakespeare.